found in Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Here now the reading of God's holy word. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the church of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turned to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or to an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you have received, let him be accursed. Am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still pleasing men, I should not be a servant of Christ. This is the word of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. May God's blessing be upon us. And may God protect us from the enemy that would try to steal this word from us. Amen. When he was four years old, he began preparing for his job. That was the time in his family that if that was your job, you had to start working to get ready to work at your job at four years old. For 60 years, he has continued to prepare for his job. In the same way, because that's what they do with his family. Now his mother is the Queen of England. She's 86 years old. The Queen's mother lived to be 101 years old. So Prince Charles, who started at four years old preparing for his job to be the King of England, has waited for 60 years and may have to wait another 15 just based on how long his mom might live to actually take over this job he was waiting for. So at 79, maybe he'll get to have his job. A lifetime of preparation. Waiting to be and to become a king. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine what has happened in the course of those 60 years for him as someone who's preparing to be king, but the world around him. World leaders have come and gone. Nations have risen and fallen. Kings have been relieved of their duties and forcibly removed. All in the course of the time that one man was preparing to be king. Now, it's difficult for us when we think about kings. We're Americans. One of the reasons we're Americans is we decided we don't want to be living under a monarchy. We read those founding documents. They have a lot to say about what kings and kings shouldn't do to us. There's still a part of us that we kind of like to look across the ocean and look at what those kings are doing. It's in the tabloids and it's on the newscast and all those kinds of things. But even that kingship, the kingship that we see in, in England, it's more of a figurehead kingship. There's not much functionality there. Um, people don't think, they think of themselves as falling under the rule of the crown. They don't wait to hear what the king says or doesn't say to, to make their lives happen. And so we come a little bit confused, perhaps, on this Sunday that marks the end of the church calendar. The church calendar begins on the first Sunday of Advent. So we come to the end of a year, and we call it Christ the King. We have a banner up here in the back of the Bible, the cross and the crown. But we don't think about kings. We think about leaders in our country that after two years or four years or six years, you can vote them out. You can be done with the leadership if you don't like them. We don't think of 
become kings and monarchs in the same way that the rest of the world does, or even a, a few generations before the whole world did. But still we, we come to this moment in time of Christ the King. And we claim it on the calendar. And we claim it because we remember that there truly is one King of the world. One King of the whole universe who lives and reigns now and forever. And that's God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrate this morning. A King who lives and reigns forever and ever. Christ the King Sunday. One King who will never pass away, who will never have his, his kingship taken from him, who is not in preparation for some period of time to be king, but is king today, now and forever. So we come celebrating that kingship today, but also, as I read the passage, the passage in the scripture, what, what, is it, what does it even mean to have a king? And what does it mean if Jesus is king? We have one king, but Galatians tells us something else. It says there's only one gospel. There's one gospel. That's what we said, that's what we've heard in Galatians. It says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turned into a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, it says. So I'm astonished, I'm perplexed, I'm a bit upset that you're turning to another gospel. Not that there is another gospel because there's only one gospel. There's one gospel. But, but what does that mean? It would be easy for us who are living in a time 2,000 years after the, after the time of Jesus is walking on the earth to think, well, it means that, there, that there's only one gospel and there shouldn't be all these denominations and that one of them's got to have an arm or six of them have to have an arm or most of them have to have an arm except for us because there's only one gospel. And then that would be an interesting discussion to talk about the differences in denominations and the differences in um, the, the Orthodox and the Protestants and the Catholics and, and the other brands of Christianity out there talking about the one gospel. But that's not really what Paul's talking about here. Paul's not talking about the divisions yet. The divisions are yet to come. The divisions have not yet happened. This is still really early in the process of becoming the church that God has called us to be. So he's talking about something else. He's talking about really the basics of Christianity, of what the gospel is, and what the gospel is, the, the word itself means the good news. What is the good news of Jesus Christ? And I'm not really that concerned about what the other gospel is that, that Paul's worried about at the church of Galatia. I want to know what is the gospel that is the one true gospel. What is it I'm looking for? And if you read through Paul's letters, it becomes pretty clear <coughs> excuse me, what Paul thinks the one true gospel is. And what the church, through Paul, and passed along, what the one true gospel is. And it's pretty simple. Jesus Christ was sent by God. Jesus Christ lived on earth. Jesus Christ was killed died for our sins, was put in a grave, rose from the dead, and now lives and reigns forever and ever. And so that's a pretty simple understanding of what Paul is talking about when he talks about the one gospel. There's one gospel. And the one bit of good news that we all need to recognize, that's when we, when we vary from that, then we start being something else. Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died, he rose, and he lives and reigns forever. That's the gospel that Paul continues to talk about over and over again in his lesson. He says there's one gospel, that's what it is. I don't know what the people of Galatia were really worried about, what they were doing wrong. Paul saw something going wrong. Wanted to correct that wrong that you're, you're listening to another gospel. Perhaps they were missing a piece of it. Perhaps they were adding to it in a way that didn't make any sense. You know there's all kinds of heresies that were bubbling up around that time. In that first and second and third generation after Jesus was with us. But what we do know, and what we can be sure of, is what the one true gospel is. It is not about being too liberal, too conservative, or being the wrong kind of denomination, being Presbyterian, Baptist, or Methodist, or Catholic, or Orthodox, or any of those things. The one true gospel is and always will be, as we say in our um, communion liturgy, 
Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That implies if you die, that you live. If Christ has lived, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That's, it's a pretty simple understanding of what the gospel is, and sometimes we get it all wrong. Obviously, the church of Galatia was getting it wrong, and Paul was trying to clear it up and say, don't mess this up. Don't get too far afield. You're making a mistake. There is only one God. So we come back to today, Christ the King, and there's one King and one Gospel. There's a unity of what we're supposed to be about. There's one ruler of everything. And there's one message that we're supposed to be sharing. Now, thinking about kings, again, we don't, we don't have a lot of concept of what it means to, to be under a king. But, uh, but I was thinking about this in terms of a chess board. You may not have ever played chess. You may not be any good at chess. But here's what, here's what I do know about chess game of chess. The most important piece on the chess board is the king. We know that because if you lose your king, the game's over, whether you lose the game. It's the most important piece on the board, the chess, the, on the chess board is the king. Now, the king doesn't get to move as freely as the other kings. The pawns get to move forward, the, the, the rooks get to move straight sideways, the bishops get to move diagonally, and the horses, the little knights get to move up and over. And so everybody gets to move at a different level. The queen gets all the power on the board, but men understand that. We get that all the time. We take over the chart, we all understand that the queen has all the power, we're basically all over the board. And even in the chest, you lose the queen, you're probably going to lose the game. Men really have no problem with that. Men don't really know what we're talking about, so that makes sense. But it's interesting that the most important piece on the chessboard, the king, can only move like this or like this. And they got that one special move called a castle. And if they never move, they can, they can only do that with the book in the right place. So they have to have somebody else to help them make that weird castle move. That I'm not even sure if I'm doing it right when I play chess, but I always try to make the move. I say all of that to say this. Yes, Christ is King. And yes, this is Christ the King Sunday. And yes, there's only one gospel. But the, but, but the other part of the good news is, is that Jesus does not intend to do it by himself. There's a lot of other pieces in play. And we are on those pieces. And we are all called to do something to move forward, to move diagonally, to move back and forth, to, 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 to protect the gospel and to share the gospel and to move that gospel forward. Jesus perhaps only moved one at a time, but together with us, we together. That, that, that one key, that one gospel. And it's nice that we take this time and we pause on this Sunday because next week we start a whole other year where we begin the process of waiting and remembering that we're waiting for Jesus to come. The first time when Jesus came as a baby, we're waiting for him to come as salvation and Savior of the world. And it also reminds us that we're waiting for him to come back to return. The return of that king. All of what we read in the New Testament is about the one gospel. What is the gospel? Jesus lived. He died. He rose. He'll you know, come back again. Paul's letters tell us that. The Gospels tell us how he became king. If you read the Gospels all through, it's like, here's how he became king. Sovereign of our lives, ruler of the universe, reigning this day and now and forever. It's simple, but sometimes we lose it. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget it because we have this Christ the King Sunday in the midst of Thanksgiving getting ready for Christmas. Sometimes we forget that because we forget to even pay attention to it on this Sunday. But that's what we need to do. Take something as simple as that. Christ is sovereign of the world. Yesterday, today, today, and tomorrow. And there's one gospel. He has died. He has risen. And he will come.